I'd like for you, if you will, this evening, turn with us to the book of Titus, Titus chapter 2. And we want to read verse 1. This will be our text and, and our thought, but we will touch upon some other verses. Titus chapter 2 and verse 1 says, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Um, as I was originally looking at this verse and thinking about some things, I was kind of going in one direction with it. Then when I sat down and began to pursue it, it's like it had a, a kind of a life of its own and it went off in another direction on me. But uh, there are several things here in, in this statement. It gives us several things to kind of look at and consider. And uh, the admonition that Paul makes to Titus said, But speak thou. And this is in contrast. As you go back and get the context and what led up to Paul admonishing Titus here, But speak thou. And the idea for speak here is just, you know, to. Uh, to utter sound, as just talk about uh, speech. And so he says, but when you speak, it's in contrast, we go back in chapter 1 and uh, verse 10, he talks about uh, uh, these different ones. And he says in... Uh, well, verse 9, he says, holding fast the faithful word as he had been taught. And that was one of the qualifications here uh, for a bishop or a pastor. Verse 10 said, for there are many unruly and vain talkers. So where Paul was sending Titus a Crete here who was to follow up and, and kind of finish organizing these churches and to set them in order, those things that was lacking, and to ordain elders. Evidently, um, Crete was kind of a, a tough place to minister. They, that was a, an unruly bunch of people that lived there. And, and Paul here, it says, there are many unruly and vain talkers. Now, they'll, they'll say anything. And he said, especially they of the circumcision. These were the Jews. He said, whose mouths must be stopped. He said, they subvert whole, household, whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. And so that's kind of the contrast. He, he gave that. He said, there are these uh, unruly and vain talkers. Their mouths must be stopped. They subvert whole houses, teaching things that they ought not. And then when it, verse 16 said, they profess that they know God. But in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient unto every good work, reprobate. And so that's where we see the word but. He begins this comment to, uh, to set Titus apart. You are in a different category. So when you speak, <laughs> um, the things, and originally I was thinking along the lines of the phrase, the things. And how many times we see that uh, in Scripture? Matthew 28, 20, where Jesus, in giving the commission and teaching them all things whatsoever I have commanded, and along with it. That word things kind of keeps cropping up from time to time. And just kind of this general, all encompassing uh, concept uh, of things, but we see it's in connection with things that are spoken, things that are taught. Um, and I believe that the things that Jesus commanded 
would be consistent with and compatible with sound doctrine. As Paul told Titus, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Jesus told him, said, you, you teach them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. Paul wrote to Timothy, 2 Timothy, chapter 1, verse 13. Notice what Paul says to, in verse 13. First, or 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. But notice how this, this form of words, sound words, which thou hast heard of me. Then in chapter 2 and verse 2, when Paul says, and the things that thou hast heard of me. Well, what things are he, is he speaking of? Well, verse 13, chapter 1, those, that uh, form of sound words which thou hast heard of me. He said, the things that thou hast heard of me, among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men. And how are you going to commit them? You're going to have to teach them. What was he teaching? That form of sound words, those same things. Faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also? And we've used this many times as an example of succession and how those, uh, the, the faith which was once and for all delivered unto the saints is contended for and, and uh, preserved, but also passed on to the next generation and then from that generation to the next generation as they were delivered. So it's the same things, the, the same words we see here and, and the importance in that. So in other words, when we speak In any spiritual biblical context, we should use sound words which are consistent with or compatible, which will enhance sound doctrine. And the word there, sound, it, it comes from, it means healthy, strong, healthy. We use the phrase sometime if we're referring to someone as being strong and healthy, we say they're they're sound in body. You know, if they're if they're healthy spiritually, mentally, as well as physically, we'd say they're sound in mind and body. It means they're healthy, they're strong. And then no words can be healthy, huh? But uh, or the doctrine was healthy. Well, diet, you know, we're, we're in a, a time and people are very concerned about what they consume. They're very careful about their diet and what they eat. Uh, if we want to be healthy and strong, we need to make sure that we eat food that is healthy for us. That would be consistent, you know, compatible to us and will enhance our health. Well, if we want to grow spiritually, we want to be spiritually strong, we need words and we need doctrine which will enhance our spiritual health and strength. Sound doctrine, healthy doctrine. Um, and wouldn't you know, I scattered up my notes, I left a page out. There's supposed to be a page in between there. I'm going to have to, to wing it. But as we look at this idea, and we're talking about communicating here, we're talking about words. And, and this is one of the things words are important. The words that we use are important. Words have meanings. 
And what is the purpose of language and speech? But to communicate ideas, thoughts. We think something up here. I can have a thought. I can visualize something. I can have a concept of something. But how do I get that thought, that concept from here into your mind and understanding? I have to communicate some, And since we don't have mental telepathy, I can't communicate from my mind to your mind. There has to be some medium in between that can communicate that thought from my understanding, my mind, to yours. And that's words. That's speech. And when we think... God as an intelligent being, He created us. We're created in His image and likeness. And therefore, He has created us with an intelligence, an understanding, a mind. And if He wants to communicate with us and, and take that His thoughts, what's in His mind, and communicate that to us. He's going to use words. He's going to use speech to do that. Because that's how we receive. Or have it written down so we can read it. But it's words. It's speech. Whether spoken or written. And the two go together. To communicate thoughts and ideas. And so when we think about that. God, being all wise and all knowing, and creating us, He created language, He created the ability to speak for that purpose, to communicate. When He says something, we can be sure that He understands words and what they mean, and He understands grammar. And there's kind of a side thought here to this, then, if we, well, it's not so much a side thought, but it goes with it. If we would be able to understand what God's trying to communicate to us, we need to understand words, we need to understand grammar. How it works. You know, sometimes people, when they're in school, whether it's public school, home school, whatever. They're studying grammar. How many of you love to study grammar? Yeah, right. Nobody. Yeah. What's all that grammar stuff? That's not important. Well, yes, it is if you want to be able to communicate accurately. If you want to be able to learn and receive information, or if you want to be able to speak it or communicate that to someone else, See, if you have feelings, if you have thoughts, you have ideas in your mind, and you want to communicate those things to someone else so they understand what you're feeling, what, what you're thinking, what you're going through, words become important. That's how we communicate those things. And how much more important is communicating the truths of God's Word? Brother Enrique uh, Cantu can kind of understand some of this because he's bilingual. And sometimes some of the problems they run into in Mexico is having sound doctrine in Spanish so they can communicate that to the Mexican people. And so these are some of the concepts Paul's talking about here. Words are important. And certain words are important that are consistent with, that enhance, that's compatible with sound doctrine. That's the reason he talks about hold on to those, that form of sound words. Because when God communicates His mind and His will to us, He chose words that communicated that. And that communicated it accurately. 
And so the words we find in the, the Bible are words fitly spoken. Words that were specifically chosen of God and used of His to communicate His will to us. And as we receive it and understand it from those words He's communicated to us, then to best convey those thoughts and that teaching and that doctrine that is sound, then we need to use the same words that He chose. And that becomes important, especially in this day and time, because of so many different translations. We, as a people, as a whole, have become very careless in our speech. I remember how it's Brother Dean Braun, Brother Braun, the Dean of Lexington Baptist College when I was there. And he could, uh, he, people accused him of being able to think in Greek. Not just that he could read it and, and teach it or communicate. He could think in Greek. I mean, he, uh, Hebrew, uh, he was a smart man. And, and so words and grammar was something that was important to him. And he got upset. I mean, he really got upset when Webster's Dictionary included the word ain't. You know, it used to say, well, ain't ain't in the dictionary. It is now. And he, refer, from that time on, he referred to it as Webster's abomination. Words are important. We have become careless in our speech, in our use of words. You know, now, from what I understand, uh, in a lot of high schools and things now, they're allowing people to, you know, use the street slang and and stuff like that in their papers that they write for English class and speech class. Well, they're just that's how they communicate. They may communicate with one another that way, but they, it'd be difficult for me to understand what they're talking about. And it's certainly that those words cannot communicate the truths of God's Word. So this becomes an issue. And this is kind of, of how sloppy we've gotten. And, and now we have one of the contributors to that is the, the texting. You know, the little uh, short initials, you know, that mean different phrases and what have you. And they actually have a name for it. They've even come up with a term for that. It's almost like it's another language. Uh, and I forget what that word because I don't text that much. You know, I know a few little things. LOL. Uh, but um, and that's pretty close to the extent of my <laughs> knowledge and use of that. You know, that's one way and, and people communicate. But how can you communicate these thoughts as deep and as rich and as important because in this is life. This is your eternal life we're talking about. Your eternal destiny. We cannot be careless with this. And we cannot just say whatever. Say, well, that's okay. you know what I'm talking about. No, we need to be precise. And there are certain words that communicate certain ideas. There are certain words people don't like to hear because they don't like the doctrine. You know, some people, you just say the word election in a, well, I'm sorry to say, in a, in a church connotation, but sometimes you talk about a political connotation, they get just about as upset. But, you know, in, in church capacity, in, in, in a biblical or spiritual religious connotation, you use the word election, some people get upset. Predestination. But those are Bible words. And so we see this movement, this tendency to try to change those words. 
or to use, come up with different phrases and different words to describe different things. Uh, there's a number of examples and issues of this where, you know, instead of a worship service, And because we've come up and, and, and we have a certain form and, and when we hear the word worship, we think, you know, coming into God's house, we think of singing hymns, we think of the preaching of God's word, and, and we associate certain things with that term worship. And many words, you know, from the Hebrew and Greek are, are meant to conjure up these images in our mind. And so, but now, the, the, a lot of, they're trying to get away from that and call it this a, a celebration. It's not a worship service, it's a celebration service. Boy, doesn't that sound nice? Doesn't that just give you a warm, fuzzy feeling? They're celebrating. Well, you know, the child of God, if someone is genuinely saved, they can rejoice in the truth of their salvation. And they can come together with God's people. And we can be in a spirit of celebration, if you will. But some people come together and what they, they have is not worship. I mean, it's a, a, a feel-good-in-the-flesh celebration, but it's not worship. Um, there's something else that was kind of in my mind along that. Uh, oh, we talk about uh, uh, observing the ordinances. You know, and different terms like that that have sp specific meanings. And we get away from those terms. And even though maybe these terms, they've come from the Hebrew and the Greek and have been translated into the English. But in the language, I don't really understand a lot of Hebrew or Greek. I know enough that I can look them up in my concordance. I can look the English word up in my concordance and find out what it means in the Hebrew and the Greek. But I'm not a Greek scholar or a Hebrew scholar. And so for me to understand something, I have to see it or hear it in English. That's my language. That's what I communicate in. That's what my brain is able to process. But it's important that we accurately translate and understand from the original languages which were inspired of God. These are the words that God chose to communicate His mind, His understanding, His will to us. There was a number of verses of Scripture that I had in mind. Um, well, here's one. This was the one I was thinking about, and I was trying to get in mind what it was, and then I had to be right, turned right to it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul, writing here to the church at Corinth, uh, and notice with verse 4, beginning with verse 4, what he says, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4, and my speech, see that, that brings us back to our text, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Those things which you've heard of me that I taught and so on, that form of sound words and all. Notice what Paul says here. My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and power. That is, not only did the effectiveness of what he said was not so much in that he was a great public speaker, 
That he knew how to use enticing words to get people to do what he wanted them to do. But he spake the word of God and depending on the Holy Spirit to take and convict people's hearts. See, the Holy Spirit, and here another concept that, that works into this, men spake the, all Scriptures given by the inspiration of God. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And so, when that Word of God is preached, that is what the Holy Spirit uses and works to convict our hearts. Not the words of man's wisdom, but the words of God's wisdom. The words that God chose. The words that the Holy Spirit Himself helped to inspire. And the words that He uses when He's working upon the hearts of lost sinners to bring them under conviction. And so He says here, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. How be it? We speak wisdom among them that are perfect or mature. So we can use those big fancy words with those that understand them. Said, how be it? Said, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world, that come to naught. He said, those words communicate. Said, that's all going to come to nothing. The words that that the the philosophies and teachings of men. He said, that's going to come to nothing. So I don't want to use men's words. I don't want to use the, the words of the philosophers and the wise men of this world. He said, you know, I, I can speak a, a, in wisdom with those that are wise, said, but yet not the wisdom of this world nor the princes of this world that come to naught, but we speak the wisdom of God. And, and as we went back, God is communicating to us his will, His desire for us. He communicates to us our sinfulness. He communicates to us His holiness and righteousness through His words. And that as a righteous judge, He must judge us and hold us to account for the things that we speak and the things that we think, much less the things that we do. To a holy and righteous and a perfect law and standard of righteousness. And He communicates how He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins. So it's a mystery, but these things He reveals to us through His Word. Which He goes on to say here, it's a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. You know, forever, O Lord, Thy Word is settled in heaven. His whole purpose was settled and determined before the foundations of the world. And that included His Word. That included this. All the wisdom and knowledge and understanding and truth that's communicated in this book was settled in heaven before the foundation of the world. But it was purposed for our glory. It was ordained for us. It said, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the thing God hath prepared for them that love Him. And this isn't just talking about in our future glory, the new Jerusalem and those things, but this whole concept of salvation, God's eternal purpose and will, is a mystery to man. Man, you know, we, we talk about the Bible. Now, now man can in, come up with some tall tales. Man, is, he can invent all sorts of things. But you know the old saying that truth is stranger than fiction. And the reality and the truth of what God has purposed for us 
No man could ever have conceived of it. Much less have written about it on their own. God Himself had to communicate these things to us or we would never have thought of it. Now this idea some people have about religion that man has made it all up. Man has made it up as a crutch. You know, the people that need religion need church, need a God that they're weak, they need a crutch. And so men that are weak have invented all these things. Or men that wanted to create some kind of a hold over other people have invented all these things. Now, they couldn't have invented this. Now, there's a lot of that kind of stuff out there in the world. But the things that God has purposed, man could never have conceived of on their own. I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that loved him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. So he has revealed it. God's revealed it to us by his Spirit. And how? Through the inspiration of God's Word and in the conviction of the Holy Spirit as his Word is preached. The Holy Spirit that opens our eyes of our understanding so we might see and understand what God is saying. He's revealed that to us by the Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all the things. There's that word. All the things. Yea, the deep things of God. In other words, the Holy Spirit is God. He's the third person of the Godhead. And so everything that is in the mind and heart of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit knows. And He communicates those things through His Word. It said, For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? You know, there's a lot of things about human psychology and all that we can understand. We can figure out because we're a man. We know how we think. You know, it's the spirit of man that's in us that we understand the things of man. Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. And so, do, He freely gives these things. He makes them available to us by His Spirit. You know, we, I, I'm amazed many times and I have to, you know, I just step back and wonder, you know, Lord, why did you allow me to understand these things? You know, I, I'm no great intellectual you know, I wasn't an outstanding student in high school. I, I, I would not have been someone that would have gotten a scholarship to a college based on my grades. So there's a lot of people out there that are smarter than I am. Why is it that I see these truths? They are so obvious to me. And some of the smartest people in the world can read the same thing and have, have no concept of what it's talking about. It said, unto you it has been given to understand the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but unto them it has not been given. Verse which things also we speak. So here's the thought, here's the concept, here's the idea, and God has opened our understanding to receive it, to understand it. He says these same things then that we speak. And Paul, that's what Paul is telling Titus, but you, here's these unruly speakers, they talk about vain things, they taught, teach things they ought not to teach. He said, but you, 
You speak those things that become sound doctrine. He said, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth. See, if man's wisdom is wanting to change these words around, they want to talk about different things. And, and it's, we see it in the way that people describe uh, activities like we say, instead of calling it worship, we call it celebration. There's a difference between what those two words, the, the concepts behind those words and what they mean. When I have a birthday party, or you have a birthday party for one of your children, that's a celebration. But it's not worship. And we come into God's house, we don't want to act like we would at a birthday party. Amen. It's to be sober, reverent, you see. There's a difference. Not the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Words that the Holy Spirit teaches. And I believe that as, as we see Paul when he admonished Timothy, when he admonished Titus, said those same things that you heard me teach among many witnesses, those same things you teach to faithful men. You commit it to these faithful men who in turn will be able to teach others also. You know, it's kind of sad. We, there, there was a game I used to play in school and, and they, they've used it different times. You know, bridal showers and baby showers. And we used to do this school. And, and I think it's called uh, gossip or something like that. We have a bunch of people sitting here and somebody, you know, you have a phrase, you have a statement, and you whisper it to the first person, and you can't repeat it. What they hear, think they hear, they have to whisper to the next person. And so on down the line. And it doesn't travel very far, and it is just mumbled sounds. It's not in intelligent words at all. It's lost all resemblance to what the original message was. Can you imagine, for 2,000 years, the people of God have been doing what Paul admonished Timothy to do. Those same things that you received to me, which I taught, you heard me teach in front of many witnesses. Those same things, those same words, that same form, you commit to faithful men. And then those faithful men will teach others also. It is not humanly possible to preserve accurately that message from generation to generation to generation apart from the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Not only do you have just by, by nature and, and, and all a mixing and, and a misunderstanding of words and intent and all, but then you have people that rise up that deliberately want to change the message. Only in the Lord's true New Testament churches whom He commissioned and whom He has empowered and has indwelt with the Holy Spirit, is it possible to preserve that message from generation to generation to generation in spite of every effort of Satan and the gates of hell to prevail against it and to prevent that from happening? And yet I believe that we are preaching and teaching the same truths that the saints of God have preached from the times of Christ and the apostles to this present day. Now they didn't preach them in English. 
Well, we, it's the same truths. It's the same form of sound words. It's the same sound doctrine. I was telling Brother Enrique, the, the Bryan Station Church, when it was the property that was deeded to them by one of the deacons in the church. And in that deed, there is a statement of faith and belief with the stipulation that if that church ever ceased to teach and practice those things, that property was to revert back to him or his heirs. And in that, it specifies, you know, election, predestination, and it goes down. I, I don't remember everything, so on, but there's a doctrinal statement there. You know, and the claim of Brian's station, and it's true, it said we're still preaching the same truths today that we preached before Kentucky was a state. But it didn't start there. These are the same truths that uh, the people of God have been preaching for uh, 2,000 years. Just like Paul told Timothy to do. From generation to generation. Because we hold fast to that form of sound words, and, and speak those things that becomes or consistent with and enhances sound doctrine. Well, that's something people just want to get away from. The sound doctrine. They hate that phrase. Don't they? And yet we find it all through the Scriptures and the importance of it and how it's admonished. He's talking about the Apostle Paul. How he begins his letter and he lays down these doctrinal things. And then he begins to discuss the practical applications and how we live and how we're to act. One is the foundation for the other. You take away the sound doctrine. And that's why you just look around. You know, we talk about the churches and all. And how the churches once were sound and, and believed these things and believed in the inspiration of the Scriptures and, and believed in the virgin birth of Christ and the, all these things. Now they don't so much teach that or hold to that as important anymore. But now you look at the lives of the members too. The immorality, the broken marriages, the... Uh, He's talking about, you know, he's talking about, you know, you, sometimes you have couples that are living together, not married, and they want to be baptized and join the church. They don't see anything wrong with it. And some churches aren't allowing it. Doctrine and holy living, sound doctrine and holy living go together. You cannot separate the two. And that's one of the things we see in our text. One of the, the things I was talking about that even in the translations, these modern translations, you know, when Paul admonished Timothy, he said, you know, preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. He said, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But in place of that, instead of that, they'll heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. That is, their ears will be itching to hear something else. And they will uh, surround themselves, they will find themselves, they will hire for themselves someone that will preach what they want to hear. And in, being, in doing so, they will turn from the truth and be turned to fables. And, and so to satisfy that desire amongst the people that will not endure sound doctrine, you know, why are there so many translations into English now? Just one after another, after another, after another. Well, one thing is money. There's a market for these Bibles. And so each one of these translations is copyrighted. And you can't use it without permission of the copyright holder. And they get a percentage off of every one of them that's sold. That's part of it. But why the need for all these different translations? It's to satisfy those itching ears. Because they're changing the word. They're not holding fast to those words. Words have meaning. One example I was thinking of, and I'll just use this. 
that I, I understand it in some places. You know, the King James will translate both in the Hebrew and in the Greek certain terms as a virgin. Well, some of these translations, they don't use the word virgin. They'll use young maiden instead. There can be a, a, a difference. <laughs> um, and one of the, look in Deuteronomy 22, 33. Deuteronomy. If a damsel that is a virgin be betrothed unto a husband, and a man find her in the city and lie with her, and it goes on. But I, I just want you to, to know there's two different terms used there. Because there's a distinction. See, a young maiden, a damsel, that word it kind of signifying the age, and it may signify a, an unmarried a woman, but it's a young woman, a damsel. I looked that word up there, it usually means from infancy to adolescence, somewhere in that range. It's a damsel. It's a young female. But then it specifies a damsel that is a virgin. Now, it wouldn't make much sense to say a damsel that is a young maiden. Because you've already specified it's a young maiden with the word damsel. The word virgin implies something else altogether. But there are some places where the word virgin is kind of by itself. They want to translate it a maiden, a maiden. But there's a difference. Um, this one I found interesting over in Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 21, verse 13 and 14. It's talking about the priest and who a priest could marry. In verse 13 it says, He shall take a wife in her virginity. That's kind of specific. It said a widow or a divorced woman, or profane, or a harlot, these shall he not take, but he shall take a virgin of his own people to wife. You know, so, the idea of a virgin is someone who is pure, someone who is chaste, not just young, but someone who is chaste, that is, has not known a man. And it, it certainly makes a difference. We see that the right terminology in Deuteronomy was necessary for a legal definition. <coughs> this implies the, the legality of a situation, whether or not someone was worthy of death or not. So there was... It's important in law, it's important that we define accurately what we're talking about so that there's no confusion in, in court and in trial. <clears throat> we see that there is a spiritual importance here too uh, for spiritual qualification. And we see that it's also necessary for sound doctrine. Luke chapter 1, verse 34. Well, before we go to let's go to Matthew chapter one. Verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph before they came together. 
<coughs> she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Now he's explaining it here. She was pregnant. But she did not have a man. She had been a spouse or engaged to Joseph, but they had not come together yet. Supposedly she was still a virgin. Joseph didn't know this yet. But it, it inserts this as explanatory. It is a child of the Holy Ghost. Then when Joseph, her husband, being a just man, they, hadn't, they were espoused. He was considered the husband. And she was considered his wife. But they had not come together and had the marriage consummated yet. And it was during the engagement period. But legally, they were considered husband and wife. And so being a just man, not willing to make a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins." Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child. Not just a young maiden. But this was miraculous. And so it's important here that we understand the, the terminology used to say that a maiden shall be with child. It's nothing extraordinary. But to say a virgin is with a child, that's miraculous. And shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not. It's important. That's, that has to do with her virginity. He knew her not. He had no relationships with her until she had brought forth her firstborn son and he called his name Jesus. Now that phrase, he knew her not, you know, that comes in in, in uh, Luke one thirty four. When the angel appeared to Mary before he appeared unto Joseph. And he uh, appeared unto Mary and told her what was going to happen. That she was going to bring forth a son. Verse 31, Luke 1, 31. Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and shalt bring forth a son and shalt call his name Jesus. And then verse 34, Mary questions it. How can this be? How can I conceive and bring forth a son seeing I know not a man? She was a virgin. And so this is an example that God chose words. And these words are important because then that underlines the, the doctrine of the deity of Christ, the miraculous conception and birth of Jesus Christ, and that reflects upon Him as our Savior, as the Son of God. You take that one thing out of the equation and you, the whole thing is off. Vain talkers. There's a lot of very educated, vain talkers in this world teaching things that they ought not. And so we need to be careful. And, and so, you know, we use terms like perpetuity, succession, immersion. You know, for, for baptism, it's immersion. It's not dipping, pouring, sprinkling, because the word in the Greek means to dip, to plunge under, to immerse. It doesn't mean to sprinkle or pour. So we use these terms to convey 
truths, the spiritual truths of God's Word. And we want to hold to those words because we want to hold to the doctrine and teaching that was once for all delivered to the saints. So, he admonishes Titus, and through Titus, he admonishes us. And me as a pastor and, and a teacher of these things, but you also, when you, you learn these things and you go to witness to someone, use those same sound words and sound doctrine that was communicated to you. And if I'm having difficulty trying to express those thoughts, will you come and ask me? What do you mean by that, brother? I'll be happy to kind of sit down. Sometimes maybe I, I said something that wasn't exactly the, the best way to communicate the idea. You know, and this is something we're all good. We know what we mean up here, but sometimes what comes out and what the other person hears is not the same thing as we're thinking here. So if there's a question, you know, let me know. But that's what we need to be careful. Uh, we need to understand what we're saying. Understand that the words that we use are supposed to have meaning. Words do have meanings. But we need to use the words that accurately convey the doctrine, the teaching of the Scripture. That which God has given to us. Because we know what He gave us, the words He chose. That's what the old saying, He said what He meant and He meant what He said, is true. And we need to stick with that and be careful in the things that we hear. <laughs> but remember, there, there are vain talkers out there. And how are you going to know? Because you know this. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, we know this word is true. If they speak not according to this word, it's because there's no light in them. If any man come and he brings not the doctrine of Christ, don't receive him. Don't listen to him. Don't bid him God speak. Don't become a partaker of his evil deeds. So, Hold fast. And when you speak, speak the things which become or becoming. You know, we, we, we use the phrase sometimes when we're speaking to our wives or we're speaking to the women. Well, you know, that dress is really becoming on you. That's becoming you. What do we mean? Well, it looks good on you. It enhances your, your appearance. And that's the same way it's using that uh, the sound words that become, words that become sound doctrine. It's consistent with, it enhances, it goes, uh, it harmonizes with it, it goes with that sound doctrine. And so that's, that's what we need to do. Let us stand.